Hi, today I'm going to talk about how my flightbook uses the GPS on the mobile apps and how you can import and export uh, flight tracks uh, into and out of your logbook. I'm doing the demo today on an iPad, but all of this applies just as well to an iPhone or to an Android phone or tablet, uh, as long as you're using the My Flightbook app uh, for the respective uh, platform. So I'm going to start here on the new flight page, but actually the first thing I'm going to do is just talk about the settings that you want to turn on in order to actually make use of the, of the GPS. So in the lower left corner here, where it says settings, I'm going to tap. And I'm going to scroll down just a little bit, and we're here we're in the middle of the screen uh, is where the, the, the key GPS-related options are. The first one here is auto-detect takeoffs and landings. This is what tells the app whether or not it should be listening to the GPS when it thinks a flight may be in progress to try to figure out if you've, uh, if you've gone airborne or if you're, you've touched Earth. Um, and it does this using uh, the speed of the, the, the ground speed as reported by the GPS. And you can actually see that down below here where it says takeoff speed. Um, and the idea is uh, that uh, you know, an aircraft like a Piper Cub uh, has a very low takeoff speed and a, a, a Boeing 777 has a very high takeoff speed. Uh, and so you can set the, the takeoff speed uh, based on the kind of aircraft that you're flying so that you get the most accurate results. Uh, and if you, anytime you exceed that speed, I treat that as a uh, takeoff event. Anytime you fall below that speed minus a little fudge factor, that's a landing event. Optionally, you can also record your flight data. Uh, this is completely independent, but you do need to uh, have uh, GPS permissions to, to do it. And in this case, I'll show you not only your airport to airport connect the dots path uh, on the map, but I'll also show you your path through space. Uh, the connect the dots path is blue, the path through space is red, that's how you can tell them apart. Um, by default, I do this every few seconds because that gives you a perfectly good picture and it doesn't uh, have enormous, uh, uh, enormously large data files. So it's a lot faster to upload and download and to work with when you're doing analysis on the web. But there is an option uh, here to record in high resolution if you're using third-party apps like Cloud Ahoy that require a higher level of resolution. Uh, and when I, when I do that, I record every sample that I receive. There's another option here called flying at night, which you probably will never need. Uh, in the U.S., of course, night flight uh, is from the end of evening civil twilight to the start of morning civil twilight, and night landings are from one hour after sunset to one hour before sunrise. Uh, but these rules actually differ around the world, and so if you need to be flying with different night rules, you can set that here. Finally, when I detect a takeoff or a landing, I uh, automatically find the nearest airport to your current location and append that to your route of flight. Um, so there's an option to include heliports in that. Sometimes heliports are, are co-located with, uh, with airports or sometimes uh, with the margin of error in a GPS, uh, if you're getting poor uh, signal, it might pick something up from the hospital a block and a half down the road. Um, so if you're flying a helicopter, I would, I would advise to turn this on. Uh, but if you're flying a fixed-wing aircraft and actually landing only at airports, uh, then uh, this can cut out uh, false positive uh, uh, helicopters, uh, hel heliports. So let me go back to the new flight screen. And I've, I'm, I'm sitting in a room right now. I'm not in the cockpit. So this is obviously uh, uh, simulated to be uh, illustrative. Uh, but let me just show you what's going on. So here I've uh, got a flight going uh, where I, I took off from PDX, uh, Portland, Oregon. And here in the in the cockpit section, uh, I, I've started my engine at 11.20 a.m. and I took off at 11.27. So I'm in flight. The system, in order to conserve G, uh, your battery power, only listens to the GPS when it thinks that a flight may be in progress. And it defines a flight as being in progress as having either a start, an engine start time or a flight start time, but no engine stop time. Um, so that's exactly the scenario we have right now. There is no engine stop time defined. 
And if we look above that a little bit, we'll see that there's sort of a, 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 an in-the-cockpit dashboard. It tells me how much time has elapsed in the flight, what my altitude is, what my speed is, uh, am I on the ground or in the air, uh, signal quality, what's my latitude, longitude, and what's sunrise and sunset at my current uh, position. Uh, one of the neat things here is you'll see these two uh, green bars, which is sort of the universal pause uh, symbol. And you see how the elapsed time is, is ticking up. If I press that, it'll pause uh, the elapsed time. And so the idea is I fly somewhere for a $100 hamburger, I pause, and then at, after I'm done eating and I climb back in the cockpit, I can uh, unpause it and hit play, uh, and it'll pick up. And that way I can record uh, the two legs of that flight as one flight and still have fill in the correct time on my behalf. So let's pretend uh, that I'm landing and I'm just going to shut the, the engine down right away. Okay, so a few interesting things have happened. One is that in the root field up above, it's filled in my nearest airport uh, because it detected a landing. Well, I told it I landed in this case because I'm, I'm demoing, but, but, but the GPS would actually do that. And if I look in the times down below, um, it's filled in two things here. The total time, 2.23, that's uh, the difference between uh, 11.20 a.m. AM AM and 11, uh, 1.34 p.m. And actually, let me show you where that uh, can be adjusted. If I go back into settings, up here, the second item from the top where it says total time, you can see it says engine time. But I could, I could have it auto-fill engine time, uh, the total time based on flight time or Hobbs time or block time uh, or even flight start to engine end. But I'm just going to leave that at engine time. But the other thing it did was it auto-filled that total time. It cross-filled it to the cross-country field because uh, Portland is more than 50 nautical miles away from me. Uh, and I use 50 nautical miles as the cross-country threshold because that's cross-country for every purpose. There's no... Uh, uh, at least that I've ever found. There's no definition of cross-country where it has to be more than 50, but there are plenty of definitions of cross-country I, I know that allow for 25 nautical miles or even just leaving the, uh, uh, the home airport. You're welcome to log that if, if you like uh, in the cross-country field. There are other ways to log it. Uh, I just uh, uh, use 50 because it's, it, it's conservative. Now, uh, again, because I'm not actually simulating a flight, it didn't, and it's because it's daytime, it didn't fill in the night field. But if I, any of my flight time was at night, it would figure out the, uh, the amount of that time that was nighttime, and it would show up in the night field. And up here, where in landings, in the upper left corner, any landing I do would count to the landing uh, field. It would add one, two, three... And then any subsets of those that it determines to be full stop landings, either during day or during that night uh, landing period, will accrue to day full stop and day uh, and night full stop. So you know, if I do uh, two touch and go landings uh, uh, before an hour after sunset and one full stop landing after an hour after sunset, then it will automatically fill in three landings one night full stop, one of which. So the, the night full stop and day full stops are subsets of the total landing count. Um, I can, of course, also cross-fill to any time field from the total field just by pressing and holding. So, for example, if I press and hold on PIC, you'll see that it cross-filled from the total time uh, field. That's just a nice little uh, uh, time saver. Uh, so... The, the system, based on the GPS, was able to fill in my route of flight, all of my landings, my night flight, my cross-country, my total, and with a little bit of press and hold, I can get in the rest of the field. So all that's really left for me is to put in some comments, fill in any approaches or any other properties that can't be detected, and the flight's ready to save. So it, it saves you a lot of data entry, and it makes sure that it gets it nice and accurate. All right, I'm going to change gears now and show a little bit about how you can share data in and out of my flight book. So I'm going to switch to my recent flights. I'm going to pick this Angel flight from May 25th, the second uh, most recent flight, because I think it's a, it's a good flight uh, uh, to show. And you notice, actually, I have some pictures uh, from that flight. I'll talk about that in just a second. If you look at the root field, you'll see that there are two buttons, on, uh, circular buttons on the right-hand side. A little plus button that will append uh, the nearest airport uh, if you tap it, or 
if you press and hold it, will append your current uh, latitude and longitude. And then there's a little um, eye in a circle, which will show you your route on a map. So let me uh, zoom in here. And you can see, I, I mentioned I was going to show those, uh, talk about those pictures. I took those pictures while flying over the Cascades, and you can see exactly where they were, uh, uh, where, where they were taken, where I was when they were taken. And if you want to see it in more uh, detail, you can just tap it and uh, hit the, the information button. And uh, there's the picture that I got of Mount Rainier. Kind of nice picture, I think. The blue line is my airport to airport route, and the red line is my uh, path through space. So you see, you can see I got vectored around a little bit. It actually looks like my paths crossed, uh, but, they, but they didn't. Anyhow, suppose I want to send this to uh, uh, Cloud Ahoy. If you look up on the toolbar, the rightmost uh, icon is a box with an upward facing arrow. That's uh, Apple's standard send uh, icon. So if I tap that, It, uh, oh, there we go. Um, it gives me a set of applications that know how to read uh, the flight track. So I send the flight track in a format called GPX, Golf Papa X-Ray, which is an XML-based format, if that means anything to you, that is nothing more than a sequence of time-stamped positions. And each position includes a latitude and a longitude and uh, depending on where the data came from, speed and altitude as well. Uh, if you're using my flight book to record the data, it includes speed and altitude. So here I can see all the different applications that might know how to uh, read a GPX file. I can copy it to Dropbox or I can copy it to Cloud Ahoy. And so it's as simple as that. On the Android app, it's the same uh, thing, except I think it's a floppy disk icon uh, to, to save uh, the file. Now, I know a lot of people uh, use uh, ForeFlight in the cockpit. I'm actually one of them. You can use ForeFlight to record your, your flight track if you like. Um, so I'm going to pull up ForeFlight here. Um, uh, or you can use my flight book. My flight book runs in the background, and that, that uh, should work just fine. And, uh, uh, but, but whichever one you use, if you, if you use an app like uh, like for flight or you use a bad elf or, or similar. It's a, a very similar process to what I showed um, to get it into my flight book, except that obviously instead of going out of my flight book, you, you're going to do a send from that app and send it to my flight book. So here I'm going to pick uh, a, a flight from October here, the second one down here. And uh, it, this is in the track logs for, for for flight. And in the upper right corner, I'm going to tap the little send icon, same icon, and here it says open KML in. KML is another format very similar to GPX. Um, uh, GPX I think is a little bit cleaner for, for this purpose because it's, it's much uh, simpler and uh, uh, you can do a whole lot of stuff with KML uh, that, you, that you can't do with, with GPX, uh, but that can also be a lot more confusing about what you're trying to do. Uh, so I'm, if I tap open KML in, it's the exact same thing, so I could send this from ForeFlight to Dropbox or Cloud Ahoy, or da 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 da. I can copy it to my flight book. So if I tap on that to bring it into my flight book, my flight book is going to read that file and say and ask me if I want to initialize a flight from the imported flight track data. And I'm going to say okay. And now it's reading that flight track that came in from ForeFlight. And it, here, it created a flight based on that. And in fact, if I tap on that little circled eye, here you can see the, uh, uh, the flight as, uh, as imported uh, from ForeFlight. And uh, that's going to stay in my flights pending upload uh, list here um, until, so, so that way I can edit it and add any comments uh, as necessary before uh, uh, uploading it. So I hope that helps uh, explain some of the, the kinds of things that you can do with my flight book and uh, the GPS and why uh, I encourage you to use uh, the My Flight Book app when you're flying. Thank you.